trauma and grief are closely linked because whenever you have uh, a trauma and energy gets bound up in that trauma and becomes unavailable, uh, life takes a different course than if that trauma didn't occur. Uh, perhaps a certain innocence is lost. Uh, a trust and trustworthiness dissolves and is replaced with cynicism or anxiety. And life is different. And with the loss of something beautiful, the trajectory before the trauma, uh, comes grief. And this is where we come into the the, the different stages of grief which uh, the renowned psychologist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who worked a lot with the with death and dying observed, uh, that when you have a grief, you have uh, denial, uh, nothing's going on, it's, it's all fine, etc. You have anger, uh, you have uh, a stage of bargaining and kind of arguing with reality, you have depression, and then finally you have acceptance. And so uh, one of the things that occurs, for example, um, you know, a relationship partner cheats on you in the relationship, uh, which upsets your sense of confidence in your ability to pick a partner, which if you can't pick a partner, what else can't you pick? If you didn't see this coming, what else can't you see coming? Um, and so you've, you've got a shock and you've got a change in behavior. You've also got the loss of a partner, the loss of the future with that partner. And so, you know, along with everything else, the pain, etc., you also have grief in going through these stages. Uh, this ties in a little bit with the snowballing effect that can be so much of, of the devastating side of trauma. Uh, because if you cannot integrate and respond to the trauma and then you throw grief on top of it, you can't go through the stages of grief because that requires feeling. And if you're dissociating in the reptilian brain in a fight-flight-freeze dynamic, uh, you can't deeply be present for the grieving process. Now. One of the side effects that can come from this is that uh, you know many people enter a quasi or fully sociopathic state, meaning emotionally dissociative, so they no longer feel uh, either about themselves or about other people, uh, which decreases sensitivity, increases more social trauma. But in that dissociative state, one of the reasons that high trauma leads to a dissociative state um, and a you know and and you know a, a numbness is to allow the the lucid survival brain, the strategic brain, the sociopathic brain to continue to keep the body alive when the emotional brain is you know is too overwhelmed with uh, with pain. It's very difficult to navigate in a hostile environment when you're overwhelmed with grief and pain and tears, etc. And so the body dissociates the emotions to allow you to get out of tricky situations. Um, but when you're coming into your emotions on the other side, as the trauma starts to subside, what can be waiting there is a wall of grief. And when you're not particularly emotionally literate to begin with uh, and are having a rocky time, you know, healing and, and resolving the trauma, to be faced with an intense grief right on the other side of the trauma, it can discourage the, the opening up to feeling, the healing of the traumatic state because what, what you're landing in, it's like you've, 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 you've dissociated, you've taken off from some feelings of shock and, and terror and all that. And now you're landing and what you're, what you're hit with is grief, which can 
result in a quick dissociation. I can't afford to feel all this. What do I have to do to dissociate? And then sometimes we'll get into uh, addiction. But understanding the stages of grief and that they are uh, always associated with a major trauma of any kind uh, can allow us to be prepared as we exit the sociopathic stage of trauma and shock and come into feeling again to, to anticipate. I'm going to be, you know, in kind of denial of this. That's doable within the sociopathic framework. Then I'm going to get angry, but that's not, you know, you've got to feel in order to do that. Uh, then you've got, uh, you know, trying to hold on the depression, um, and uh, you know, and, and there can be a lot of, you know, of rage uh, and and underlying hurt and pain. You know, just the pain of loss, the longing for something that's drifting away. I wanted to be this way, and now I'm drifting away here. Um, so this can make it complicated to navigate out of the trauma and through the grief, particularly in a culture that doesn't grieve very well, because some, you know, cultures. Uh, uh, you know, in, in South America, etc., you know, they'll sing, they'll dance, they'll cry, they'll, they'll get the system going in the body to really process the chemicals of grief through the system in a matter of 72 hours of intense physical activity and emotion. And then you're through with it. Uh, but in a cult like our own, where uh, intense displays of emotion are viewed as weird and uh, you know, something to, to isolate someone around or shame, then, you know, it's, it's very difficult to move rapidly through a grief process, which means that the unexpressed chemicals in the body are, you know, a chemical load that the person has to carry, you know, sometimes for a matter of years without ever really grieving, crying, letting it out, and then letting that load go.